So one of the most powerful tools to uh, estimate future climate change are climate models. Climate models are very uh, powerful tools to uh, understand the circulation in the atmosphere, the circulation in the ocean, the changes on the land surface, and are essentially mathematical physical tools because they are using equations of motion in the atmosphere that we uh, are very familiar with, for example, from numerical uh, weather prediction models that we are using uh, day after day to predict the weather. Similar elements uh, are in climate models that uh, allow us to project uh, future climate change. However, to do that, we also need to make assumptions about uh, scenarios. Uh, whenever people uh, try to identify things that uh, may uh, happen in the future, we think of scenarios. Uh, take, for example, uh, your personal life. Uh, uh, if you uh, project yourself in 20 or uh, 50 years, uh, you make a scenario. What if I earn a lot of money in 20 years? What if uh, I lose my job in 20 years? Uh, this is a scenario and uh, climate models are using also scenarios regarding the emission of greenhouse gases. So we're looking at scenarios uh, which describe a world uh, that has made a transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energies. Uh, that is a so-called climate mitigation scenario in which uh, future climate change will be limited to less than two degrees and other scenarios which we call business as usual scenarios that continue uh, with using fossil fuels. Now these scenarios serve as input to the climate models and these climate models use a, a huge amount of computing time and so there are now uh, more than 20 centers worldwide who in a concerted effort are using these models, uh, compare these models uh, to one another, uh, write scientific papers about uh, understanding these models, comparing the models to uh, the observations in the atmosphere, in the ocean, uh, in the cryosphere, uh, the frozen world, uh, uh, and uh, so take confidence in uh, the processes that these models describe. Based on these simulations, we can then look uh, into the future. It's like a window that opens uh, itself up and uh, tells us how climatic conditions in many regions of the world will look like in 50 years time, in 100 years time, depending on the scenario that uh, we are inputting into these models. Essentially, uh, these models tell us uh, two different worlds, uh, a world that uh, uh, shows a climate change that is limited, uh, a world that will be different from the world as we know it today. It will be warmer, uh, the precipitation uh, patterns will have changed, uh, extreme events will have changed, sea level will have risen. But uh, this is, uh, these are changes uh, to which uh, we believe that uh, man can adapt. We can deal with these changes. This is fundamentally different from uh, the results that climate models tell us for a business as usual scenario, in which the world will be by the end of the 21st century over four degrees warmer than uh, during the end of the 20th century, with consequent changes uh, to the water cycle. Essentially, areas that uh, have abundant water already today and are facing uh, flooding occasionally will receive more water and uh, areas uh, like the Mediterranean or other dry areas which are today challenged by the shortage of water will even uh, receive less water in the future. It is also a world where uh, sea level uh, will rise on the order of uh, half a meter, uh, perhaps even up to a meter. Uh, a world that has uh, completely different statistics of extreme events. Uh, heat waves will become much more frequent. Heavy precipitation events will also be frequent. And that means that uh, serious challenges will uh, lie ahead of us uh, regarding adaptation. There will be many regions in the world where the limits of adaptation will be reached. And uh, so it is uh, these climate models that inform us in a quantitative manner about uh, the consequences of our choices today.
We take a lot of confidence in these climate models. That confidence rests on uh, two things uh, that the scientists uh, are actually very carefully looking at. The first thing is that we are using uh, known physics, the physical processes uh, that describe circulation, that describe the transfer of radiation uh, from the sun uh, through the atmosphere to the Earth's surface, and that we understand these physical laws that are the basis of these climate models. The second uh, uh, topic uh, from which we derive confidence into these climate models is their um, similarity with observed processes. So we can actually go back in time uh, 50 years and look at observations, at modes of variability and ask these climate models uh, whether they are able to reproduce uh, what nature has shown us as in terms of variations in the climate system. And uh, these models on the large scale do a remarkable job in simulating uh, the intricate behavior of the atmosphere, the ocean, the sea ice uh, and other surface processes on the planet. And that is the confidence from which uh, we build our projections. Obviously there are still remaining uncertainties. Uh, we have noted, for example, in the last assessment that was carried out uh, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that these climate models uh, still have uh, great difficulties in uh, simulating the water cycle. And yet the water cycle is a fundamental resource for humans and ecosystems. So I am looking very much forward to a lot of progress uh, in uh, climate model development in the near future regarding our ability to simulate water cycle changes. So when we look at uh, the way how scientists have uh, modeled the climate system uh, historically, then uh, we we'll look at uh, an early phase at the beginning of the 20th century when uh, the scientists tried to look into the past and extrapolate from time series by analyzing cycles, by uh, looking at the environment, try to uh, forecast the future. Uh, this is a very empirical approach, uh, which has no physical basis. Uh, but uh, very early on, uh, one of the pioneers actually uh, was a Russian scientist, Mikhail Budiko. Uh, he formulated one of the first climate models that was able quantitatively to inform us about the consequences of changes in the energy supply to the Earth and its implication on the temperature distribution as a function of the geographical latitude. That is where it started. Uh, the models were then built step by step. Uh, certainly uh, the leading components were the atmosphere, where people uh, were familiar with the meteorological processes that also play a crucial role uh, for the climate change. Uh, these elements of the climate models are the most advanced ones. Uh, in the mid-70s then, scientists coupled similar models for ocean circulation processes uh, to these models. These are uh, very important components because they um, take up a, a lot of heat uh, that is stored in the climate system and uh, without an ocean component in these climate models you would not be able to faithfully project uh, the climate evolution in the future. The current uh, development concerns the inclusion of chemical cycles, material cycles uh, in uh, these earth system models and the next steps will also be the inclusion of ice sheets uh, into these uh, climate models because ice sheets are potential triggers of so-called tipping points, instabilities that can unfold uh, when the planet is warming. Uh, ice sheets can become unstable and that would have a large impact on sea level and uh, that is another quantity that these climate models are simulating.